you'll know banks operate in borders, they live in different countries, and when a regulator changes its regulation to its jurisdiction, and particularly to capital regulation, you have to remember that. That's not a spillover effect uh, all the countries where the bank is still with the community, but some of them in the countries. And that involves the grounds of coordination, like the best coordinate regulation, but it's not a sort of basic problem. And <laughs> when we do this problem, our brain should go to a classified area, which is, I guess, the best comics in the world, which might be best, but uh, anything around the there is to the central basis of the extent that bank capital is more expensive than viability of banks. If I try to make a profit, I can give my banks a bit of advantage. So if I care about the profits, I have an incentive to undercut uh, my regulations elsewhere in the world, right? Then my banks get market share and who's the companies. And so it's sort of like a published market share, you know, that's lack of coordination with the outside regulation. And then that kind of motivates the uh, the class of laws to trust the ones that we see. So, Bars and one gave us a minimum across the uh, capital market statutory. That's the size of the level of the field and here with the space at the bottom. But since then, the variety of rounds of reforms. Uh, Basel III has been introduced in national discretion before not giving any capital capital setting. It's a complete lack of potential purposes. So now we have a time barrier capital department setting discretion involved in the transport of the individual regulator in the country. Okay, uh, so you know, sort of like it comes to the market, the thing Mark mentioned there, that's what's been done every time for this cycle. But what's different about this instrument is that these buckets are people who sit there. And that means that when I set my buffer as my capital buy in my jurisdiction, every bank that lends inside the jurisdiction has here something wrong because of the base of the And this basically has changed the game. To get away from the direction of gas, to get away from the share. And this is a, a big paper. I just want to show you when we, when we have a machine like this, there are still externalities, there's still need for coordination, but rather than competition from market share, we now have competition from capital instead, which is quite a good So, in terms of the big paper, I want to basically show you. Model is a it's a very shit down model, very, very simple. The simplest thing we can do by the output is this one here, and then we'll sort of force the end to get these relationships. So, if you're static uh, model, M wants to be most neutral, there'll be loose capital in the future, uh, there'll be competitive markets, and there'll be two countries. So, in foreign, foreign where this market is like, it's finally significant. Uh, in terms of the economy in each country, very simple. The bits of the painless firms, each producing using physical capital, which are lots of smart people for the technology, and so it's classic in TFP shops. There'll be labor supply elastically, uh, mobile across countries, such as the HMS models, and that's the labor supply. It's so many households, that's the two company part of it. And everyone has access to storage technology, units for its return. That can be used to be stretching the cost of the funds in this world to this point. Okay. And then we have banks, the CDGC part of the model. Okay. Banks and mobile hospitals can lend and borrow in the country. Okay. And they lend firms to fund the investments in this capital. And they do that by raising insured deposits and equity capital. Okay, so we're now going to hear you say capital and referring to equity capital, not the fiscal capital first. And the key feature we're going to put in this model is the idea that equity capital is somehow scarce. It's not for soaking global supply. So, I want to 
to allow us to make my bags to go back. But it's not the that raises the cost of that current book that I have to spend on. Okay, and they do the lending, the massive lending, subject to the capital requirements. Now we're trying to do this attack to this idea that we see on the tree, you know, even the where the equity of the plan back is operates in the home, it's space at home, but the lens for it at home and the farm must be greater than a couple of minimum standards to get a bar, plus these two different buffers that are set up the bone and make it into the home. And then it's only how this, this requirement set by the bar regulator. This sort of captures, oops, that's my idea. This sort of captures the idea of the system. The bar regulator sets the requirement. I can't, as a time regulator, undercut um, from a bank so I go into the market. Okay. So I can't make my market share of all of it. And so what we really have is the fact that it's really beautiful. The margin the the And that means that the same the same thing the bottom of the situation, the same thing the bottom of 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 the and the second is this more stuff. And that's something a specialized vision. So the banks are specialized in being either a home lender or a foreign lender. They want to have all their lending in one country or another. And the reason for that is that the positive insurance um, discovers the justification. Is this a good option? Nice. Uh, it's effectively maximizing the value that production is quite special. That okay. so, so, and so that means that banks are only one lend a home or then the home. And so that it turns out in the real world, if you think about a holding company, subsidiary at home, subsidiary at home, and then it's a living atmosphere to set up and get that type of value. In practice, like this, oh, sorry, in that position, I guess I'd say there's two standalone banks, a home specialized bank and the bottom specialized bank. That's the easiest way to get it. Right. So, as a starting point, I'm going to just do power statics, excellent, it doesn't work out. And then we've got to pause here because the how that needs to be set in the place. So, beyond it, we think about this as a equity. Uh, these twenty banks. So there's free entry here. So back specializing in economic, you can choose the back specializing in okay. And that means that in equilibrium, those two returns plus each one. Right. So that is the first one. Okay. And of course, they're going to be equal to the cost of raising the capital. This is going to be the level of the stock. And what well, defines those two returns of this, this quantity series here, which we can think of as being the total amount of equity capital allocated to the market, namely at home, and then what? Okay. So the return in the home is going to be high, capital will be below from the borrower to the home. That's the idea. Yeah. Obviously, if I'm a regulator, if I'm a regulator, I can try and extract a couple from the board and boost the rest of the event and supply them. Did you keep time? Yeah. And anyway, it's another thing is 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 good for children because of the you know my time raised by the problem at home. Capital will flow into my electricity and you have to be positive, even if only the the return on equity in my economy is increasing in the energy. 
stories. Now, let's assume that's, that's true. You can imagine that that's the source of the idea of the state of the Then there are two sources that can happen. I can draw, I can raise more. Or I can take a capital as I can deposit them in and bring it to the money. Okay. And that needs to get similar. Okay. So, this is telling you how much the amount of capital allocated to the problem lending will change the piece of home. Okay. And basically, it's just the following the, the, the fraction between zero and one of the share that comes into the show that's going to be able to and when this is zero or one, it depends on the vertex slopes of that vertex slope. Right. So if this slope is perfectly flat, then you're going to be making which is perfectly flat. Now that inline is the first one, so I'll do everything right now. So that lets me have as well. So ST tells you basically how much of it does to have this piece of energy. But I kind of put this is not that the RBI and the posture. You have the positive instruments in this model. You mostly put things that you know, have this image to see how you want the positive insurance. That's actually being produced by the capital requirement. I'd expect that banks prefer to have lower capital requirements to get a higher return on equity as a result of this, this insurance. So it can actually kind of be a piece of capital level. That's kind of the, the starting point. And the answer is yes. And the intuition basically follows from the bit of yes to that. Okay, so imagine that you are a bank. Actually, I think she was <laughs> uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm a banking system of abundant capital, right? So there's all sorts of capital. Basically, we then just look down with so being smart about lending. Uh, but we have so much capital, basically, not that it's much bigger than which is progress by the one. Then we tighten the requirement. What happens? Well, essentially, we have to start going out and raising capital. It's not that it's costly. Okay, but that would be up this demand. You go away, you go to the one, you go up this demand. Okay. And eventually, you know, we get to a point where, as we have this demand curve, we have to compensate every holders for the collective of everything. We do that by basically generating some lens cross hops. I mean, that's the point where we essentially get the monopolist right, right, women not to choose, which maximizes that in the news. Along this region, the other dynamic is positive. Once we pass this point, the other dynamic is negative. So, this is the region where the revenue is increasing at the end line. It's kind of like this is a factor of hunger. There's a feature above that where the other side is true. Now, what has two implications? The first is that, um, the first is that for any particular gamma prime, this point exists. There's a point at which raising gamma will uh, increase the time of equity. There's a point in which beyond that point, raising gamma will reduce the time of And therefore, in this region, when the gamma is positive, so this week's the reason you have to be on that track in particular this week. And so on mark on this. This point here, the very facts of the mind, the same things that come up in the mind. It's because the banks want us to constrain quantities of use for profits. It's all of the media is saying that what's in the opposite of the university, which is no expense. It's not an increase in security, this is what it's on. Fine. So that's not the that's not a bad side of the So, we have a simple loss function where policy making cares about the economic surface as the lending that this is what we do, which makes up my standards. 
and I see with these two common exact And I can describe you know, the quantum equilibrium, the quantum equilibrium as the equilibrium that maximizes my individual layout subject to the other country playing the same strategy. I can consider a fabrical optimum where capital can't be set equally to maximize the choice. Right. And what I care about really is whether you can match last bit of the room is greater or less than that. Yes. Right. So I believe that I'm not this. If we raise the bottom, we have a match match of less than But actually, this is great. It's happening at this point. So to see to see that, think about what capital rate will do to maximize. The first term is a match mechanism we do to maximize the miles of energy of a high petrol We get that The second term is next term is we capture the fact that raise the capital of at home, which changes our capital that hit it many in the and that has been affected by uh, well, yeah. If that term is positive, it's a positive externality, it's the gamma now should be less. Okay. If you develop that very easily, it's so another this is high gamma, high prime gamma term is just the gm prime of the gamma and the capital flow from the volume to home as gamma changes, multiplies by the term which captures the social value. And that's the way it's possible. And so you always have to have one capture if you can. And that's true in equilibrium. If you know, imagine I fixed the fact that they are living in the company, clients are then they the capital more capital versus the process of choosing leverage. So I think it's a some natural we think of then the gaps in the process of the bonds together. So if I can choose leverage, we can then be confident. So that's the Now that means the anxiety has the same sign as the end line. Yeah. And this is like I said, you know, that does take to explain to you what pins down the sign of the end line now, right? If gamma is less than gamma hat. The only time you get a bunny is basically the gamma hat. The gamma is raised with gamma hat. The only time you get a bunny is positive. Yeah, it goes back to my message. Yeah. I'll be in this region. I'll be in this region. Okay. So, that means that when it raises the bottom, so gamma hat, and that might not be gamma hat less than. Uh, Oh, we're applying with the region where the balance of oxygen is greater than the normal risk of the region. So, how do I have that? You've got things about the states of the world where we have to use a button. Then the character variance can actually set the rest of the region is set from buttons. We can have a uh, greater number of the number of the switch pins. And so the exact amount of the gamma coal will be less than gamma. And the opposite picture of capital works in this case. Capital works in this case, the economy is constrained, you have less than the number of the switch pins, and the number of the switch pins. So this bring that together with the number of the switch pins. So imagine I have some two pairs of. Where my hand is required to be used. Now, what I'm not saying is that in the middle of the times, which I find in the capital screen, there's an incentive to go into segregation to the height compared to the population. And the intuition for this is that 
the class. How is it my So part of the cost of that technique is named by the form of the This capital is not the form. In the past, however, it was a bit sunny because my size in the capital apartment actually had situation that sort of parts of the populist economy. So it's how that was people who so capital leads my economy actually better this sort of thing. And so I have to think that I'm the this is too much in the past. And then if that's just one of the parts of that, I think it was next to one. It's like we did more things in the paper, so we think about their weight losses. Obviously, you can to banks, and those are also things we need to be wisely before. So, you know, fooling it out and wisely in uh, in, uh, uh swings, and so that's really bad for prices. But so, their way of the mission, it's interesting. The thing I want to say is that this is a 200 model, and okay? you think about many, many countries, often it's close. Who's going to tell the lies? The fact that they have to have a given. So, smaller countries also have an incentive to be even more in the latter form. Okay, so, a big country of the US, for instance, which clashes with the laws at the CCI, like the EU, is probably a small country like Denmark or Sweden, they may be a bit much higher than America. So, Yes, so let me just conclude. So we have a new regime when it comes to setting so time to bear in capital markets. And that regime is specific. That's the key thing that we're to when it comes to And that just means that if we have conditions that makes in this in this situation, it was supposedly we don't get a race to the bottom. And okay. uh, what we do is we have this analytical framework, so it's a okay. uh, We show that wasting capital requirements is like kind of flows in each direction. And inflows can generate an in, in incentive for race of top, excessively tight regulation. Okay, that is this situation here with the top But the direction of flow, <laughs> the cycle, and that's a big I just want to conclude by saying some policy makers are very smart and city things just to look at the goodness that we see at the time is that you can want to make sure that the one country is raising its capital fund is not to be so the expense of operations. Okay, thank you very much. So, do we actually see smaller factories in China? I should, I should, I should. Smaller countries are more active in this way. That's how I would summarize it. That's the sort of the style I start to go to the factories that used it. Could you say more about? I like to think about the matter of the gold plus you know, two regions. I mean, other things might be going on. Like, what are the changes in the fact of the economies? Sure. So, the framework is too stylized to have a few of those things. And this, as we do, we can move more precisely about what we're talking about. I'm just really, I, I, I want to start by just understanding what you're saying. So the, you present it as, as, a, as a mapping that is clear in your yeah, to go from the boom bust to the region. So maybe we could start by just understanding the children. So imagine if I want a model that have a space of the map, which is short, so that's the rest of the So in that world, we get back to my page now. The choice of the graph to regulate it. There's a lot out there, right? So, like, they lost profits, they lost capital with the balance sheets without, you know, that's the right thing to choose. They don't take any huge losses over the past two or three years. The collaborative point is this construction of its own. And it's just lost business 
this uh, <laughs> and then the the which switch to one where different sensitivity they can damage by the numbers and gravitation. Yes, I guess to just the bottom of the computer. So the thing that's moving in your telling of this is the quantity of the factory. Other things that are changing, for example, the slope of the stock variable, extent of credit risk, and that might change as you show. So that goes back to this quite blue, which is an infinite slope of swing events. But we do that too with the paper. So as the marker gets steeper, the same thing is just imagine if you have more of an inelastic marker. In a bus, that's question one. I'm not sure about what you do. That would also be it. Yeah, the same pattern. If you think that risk rises in the in bus too, that would be the same pattern. If you believe that the break losses from the bolt rise in the bus, you get the same pattern. Those are three deep parts that's what you do. But I haven't got which one I could have done with all those recessions. I like the concept capital. That's the story I can tell. And there are three things, and something people get used to. Yes, so the whole thing that you have to do is straightening out. I want to map my surface, which is I just want to make sure all the all the rents are taken out if no steps are right. But the second is how the which says look, then the inner makes that my losses. And the capital box that has that process, which makes it the box about it. And that is basically the constraints these two. Okay, those two things are more. And the more the less capital I have, the more I leave towards slash with less incentive. And that constraints. Okay. You can do other objectives, uh, just to very much a size one, but it's just a single one to the intuition. Again, 25 minutes. So I really enjoyed this. This is like it's where the predictions is really not quite clear. It's a bit weird. So I just want to remind you that this is So I think what they're saying is that if you're in a country with a you know successful or a subsidiary of all events, right? You know, then you should have a secret control type in the side of some sense, right? Like it's not necessarily going back to a more exactly different somehow, right? And that this is what we say between our between our country pair, that's the song is that I have really you know how much uh that is you know how you can think because it's not more than some secure strong way the other side. Uh, first, that's not the potential policy affects some segments of the population. 
differentiate than others. Uh, and um, the effects on our native in households are in And in particular, uh, also we need to understand what could be the potential channels for which this uh, the image of effects would look like. So then uh, what we do in this uh, paper, essentially, uh, we examine if a uh, new uh, lending to our households, where is uh, the household that uh, income and the population goes to changes. Well, the important for the household level and we don't know the basics. Uh, then in the paper, we look to some two uh, specific uh, policy instruments, uh, and both of these are uh, the lenders, which include the taxes and financial institutions. Uh, and we know how to acquire it. There are two reasons why we are focusing on this side to do our specific issues. So, the first one is because there is no strategy in that sample that we're going to say there's no strategy in the history of the And the other reason is that uh, these are uh, two uh, macro virtual policy instruments that uh, uh, differ uh, from each other in the sense that uh, the minimum capital required is the way it is calculated. Uh, in the accounts uh, for the borrower risk characteristics, uh, whereas uh, taxes on uh, foreign um, financial institutions does not. Uh, so, in the paper, we are also going to discuss uh, different channels to which the financial effects would operate. Uh, and in particular, we find the evidence for the existence of the cost of lending for the borrowing channel, as we call it, uh, and the charge of the channel. So, well, we find evidence for these two uh, channels of which the financial effect is not but it also test for some other channels for which the financial effect is not but we don't find applications for those that we uh, discuss now. So, um, to get a holistic view of the paper, uh, let me uh, give a brief preview of the results. So, um, as um, we argue in the paper, uh, different instruments uh, could yield uh, different differential effects uh, on our uh, uh, on house. So, what do I mean by this? I mean the best way to explain it, it could be like just uh, using uh, the uh, example of the instrument for considering it. So, to that end, let's first consider the taxes on financial So, following the title of uh, in the taxes on financial institution. Uh, so, what could uh, happen uh, is that um, this is actually uh, this is the cost of the land, uh, and also this would be uh, translated into the higher cost of borrowing. So, basically, the cost of borrowing uh, increases. And to the extent that high income households are more familiar with it, what they could do is that they could catch again this higher borrowing cost by essentially supplying a higher down payment. Low income households are not able to do so. So, uh, in that sense, what we're going to see is that uh, they will be able to observe the data a stronger than uh, uh, like, uh, on high income households. And just to find everybody on the same page, when I say stronger effects, what that means is that uh, the reduction in the loss will be both more pronounced or one year compared to the others. Uh, not on the contrary, let's consider uh, what happens if there is a tightening in the medium of the required. So, remember that the uh, uh, digital type of instrument explicitly takes into account the risk of uh, uh, of workers. So, following the uh, tightening in the medium of the uh, requirements, uh, what members could do is that they could um, uh, take into the strict the issue of the risk of loans, which are typically the loans to buy the loan in this. Uh, and um, uh, this is what we observe in the data, and this is also what has been shown uh, more broadly. Uh, and this LTVs are, are open, so the distance with high LTVs are also uh, out there in the past. So this is also something that we observe in the data, this is also more broadly. As a result, uh, what the differential effect is that uh, there will be strong effects on the open class. So as you can see here, depending on the discipline that we're taking into consideration, is that uh, one group of uh, households or a low income or sustainable households may end up being uh, more affected uh, by the uh, level of high income and other things. So in the interest of time, uh, I'm not going to do justice to the literature, but I would like to highlight our uh, two papers and I can go to the first paper is uh, uh, the paper by Charlie and Walters, uh, and the second one is the paper by Zeta and the Universities. 
So um, why would you mention these two papers is because uh, both of them are touching upon uh, in this concept of the intellectual attacks and the mapping down of the national policy, but they differ in the two people. Lines. So the first one is uh, that uh, they're focusing on our uh, world based measures such as known to value and known to issues. And uh, also they're looking uh, at um, uh, it is a specific uh, policy action, action that took uh, uh, in the one hand, the parliamentary engagement with uh, this clinic. Uh, whereas we are looking at multiple policy actions that took place over a longer period of time and in the time. So, uh, now let me go and give you this kind of data. So, that, uh, we are using two main data sources. So the one is the data on the national policy, which comes from the PCB um, smart potential uh, database map. So unlike monetary policy in the rural area, that is the core national policy, there is much of the spine, just and also open time. Um, we focus, as I mentioned, on, on taxes of financial institutions and minimum capital requirements, uh, but uh, in the data set, there is total 11 instruments and such as the two of the instruments that are spent. Uh, the data that net hiding is uh, a measure of the policy uh, action, which is essentially the difference between the total hiding uh, actions uh, and the total user actions in a given time they uh, are in the same. Uh, in terms of the household level data, the data that we are using that uh, is uh, from the household finance and transaction survey. So in case you're not familiar with the household finance and transaction survey, uh, this is a survey that is conducted by the ECT. Uh, and uh, soon our testing waves uh, and the current wave is underway. Uh, and uh, why uh, we're using this data set is because it uh, comprises uh, a lot of uh, information uh, on our uh, household finances, uh, but also on our socioeconomic uh, characteristics. But more importantly, also it has information on individual uh, mortgage law. And the data is quite rich because there's uh, quite a bit of information on the law in terms of the property. The type the dispersions, the loan workers, uh, the interest rate of the loan, the insurance they go under, and so on. Okay, so uh, this slide uh, presents our baseline as uh, uh, regression specification. Uh, so uh, basically, it's all uh, that what we are interested to do is we want to assess uh, the differential effect uh, on uh, different, uh, different number of potential policy instruments uh, on household borrowing within the household. Uh, so here, the unit of observation is uh, the law. Uh, index by L, uh, or given the house of I, in time C, at time uh, T, which is here, are uh, made uh, variable of interests, it's a matter of variable of interests, and uh, is an uh, interaction between the macro potential policy uh, instrument and households. Uh, uh, and they're also controlling uh, here for household level characteristics, which are as noted here in vector H, and the only other characteristics are which are noted in the right now. For the type of possible specification, uh, we also uh, have country and country line of experiments. So uh, basically, what this uh, slide shows or summarizes uh, is uh, the coefficient of the uh, main variable of interest and the uh, data. Interest of uh, space for the presentation of purposes and just showing now the uh, coefficient uh, that is of the variable of interest and all, but I just want to mention the two variables have the right sign and uh, most of them are statistically uh, significant. Um, but then uh, here I'm just focusing uh, on the article of interest, which is uh, basically in the interaction between the potential policy uh, and uh, the household income, which I do want to measure in this measure in terms of household income missiles with the income. So what you can see is that uh, the interaction between taxes are on financial institutions and household income is negative and significant. What this means is essentially when taxes on uh, uh, when uh, taxes on financial institutions start, um, uh, then uh, basically uh, high income households on average uh, tend to uh, receive smaller votes compared uh, uh, to uh, low income households. 
Uh, well, the closer it goes to slope, when there is a high degree of minimum capital requirements. So here we are observing that the minimum capital is an interaction between the minimum capital requirements and the uh, income uh, and also the income market is positive at the same time. So what this means is that uh, when there is a high degree of minimum capital requirements, uh, low income households are going to uh, receive an average smaller levels compared to the So, I mean, we are trying to understand why this is happening, right? So, to that end, we are uh, also going to rest our conditions. The one thing that we would mention in the previous slide, which is the fact that we are taking the focus of financial terms and that one uh, of the financial policy is to minimize uh, as affects most of the mouse for to the mind of mouse for any other way around, it's likely that the differential effects will be in the marriage case, which is actually what we examine this. So, um, we first uh, we examine uh, the differential as uh, the channel to this, which is the actual effect of taxes of financial uh, institutions. Uh, for the and uh, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, what we have hypothesized is that uh, we don't need the high end in this regulation. Uh, what the uh, uh, interest might that this would increase the cost of borrowing or lending, uh, this increases the cost of lending uh, for the uh, lenders, which is translated to higher cost of borrowing to the borrowers. And in response to this high amount, so we essentially have a higher number and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, we provide a good payment as a the result, they seem small. So, to that respect, what does it basically, uh, what we do with the procedure we use tax? So, the first one we check out with that in fact, the rate of the loans increases following the high uh, in uh, 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 on, on, uh, on the uh, tax on managed institutions. Uh, and second, we uh, check with that in the time of households apply higher than the day and compared to the household. So we go hand in hand uh, these two regulations so that are specified uh, here. So the first regulation, uh, so we do that uh, and uh, we are um, running these two regulations that I have uh, that I'm showing in, in this slide. On the left hand side, the first uh, application, the dependent variable is the rate on the board. And the main explanatory variable here uh, is a uh, uh, type and finger boots, so not type, but uh, taxes of regulation institutions. So it is uh, um, the main uh, uh, population choice. And we are interested to see whether uh, this policy changes, whether the, uh, uh, whether the costs are of borrowing for all households are uh, in this. In the second step uh, is uh, basically uh, we have uh, the same um, uh, regression specification as in the baseline, but instead of using uh, uh, on the left hand side uh, the low amounts, uh, we are replacing that with down here to see whether it can possible to supply a uh, uh, larger amount. Uh, Okay, so um, basically this table summarizes the two variations uh, that uh, we were interested in the previous regulation uh, that we were in the previous one. So the first one is basically uh, the variation uh, on the macro-regulation policy, which is our taxes on the initial uh, institution. So what we can see here that the variation is positive. This implies that uh, when there is a tightening in, uh, uh, in, in this regulation, uh, then uh, in, uh, this increases the cost uh, of uh, lending uh, of the cost of the loan. Uh, in the second book, uh, we see the uh, interaction that are uh, between uh, taxes on financial institutions, uh, it's not a financial variable, and uh, also income. And this is also what I'm going which would be that we did uh, either become a uh, household a supply of larger uh, payments compared to uh, income households. Okay, so that was about the first step of the instrument that we're going to say. So now we need to go to our main instrument, our second instrument, which is the minimum number of And so those who want to understand what are the channels through which of this instrument or the differential effects of this instrument are related. So let me repeat once again. 
So while our data set is not ideal, we test for this because one would not want to have data on the end side. Um, we're still trying to do some uh, analysis uh, to provide uh, um, some support uh, for against evidence uh, that are not supporting the other presence of this So what we do is we uh, run a split, uh, we split the sample and we uh, run the regulations of uh, this uh, split uh, sample uh, where we do uh, the loans such that uh, uh, depending on their global knowledge operation. So in that sense, uh, we will have a group of loans that are uh, less risky, and this will be the loans uh, that uh, are with a negative relationship between zero and three. And we'll have a group of loans uh, which are a uh, higher energy, which are moving up to the end of the um, and this, and on this uh, table, here's some analysis uh, results are from the states and the image. So the first uh, two ones basically are the results for the entire sample of rules. The second group shows the results are uh, when uh, we are considering only rules uh, with um, uh, uh, with the uh, LTPs between 50 and 100. And the third uh, group, uh, third group shows the rules uh, with the deviation of the square and And what we can see is that in the second group, the variation is uh, somewhat higher, but also more specific as a human. And in the third column, what we can see is that uh, the bone by uh, the, the variation is positive, but it's way smaller and it's also not very specific as a human. So what this results are signify is that in the group with loans that the loans that are not risky, we don't observe that uh, as low income households receive an average smaller uh, loans compared to high income households. But in the group uh, of risky loans, which is presented in the second column, we observe that there is this diminished of in the deep low income households and we see smaller uh we will not slow in the higher than that in the uh platforms on the uh, okay, um, so um, as I mentioned in the uh, beginning, uh, we're also testing for the different potential challenges, uh, so that we wish to do a from the next group of okay? Um, and uh, but we don't find it. So one such challenge, for example, uh, taxes of financial uh, institutions to open it, that is the list in each So uh, even that, uh, when there is a tightening uh, in in um, in taxes of financial institutions, this raises the cost for the lender. What they, because the lenders might uh, know it, that they might be capable in the list in each However, we can find the uh, evidence for the existence of, of this channel when we will do a separate uh, test, uh, which uh, I, I, I not have the time to go with that, but uh, the, the, the uh, analysis that I will hold on to. In terms of this, uh, the other instrument, which is the minimum capital environment, another potential challenge in which the financial effects would operate uh, is uh, essentially to this cost of capital. So uh, basically, the way the minimum capital requirements um, work is that when there is a high demand, what the lenders could do is that they could either uh, decrease uh, the risk weighted assets, or what they could do is that they could gain this uh, capital. But I think there's a capital to be lost with uh, what the lenders are talking about. We also don't have the evidence for the existence of all this but this way we have So, um, Last thing that was suggested uh, by uh, one of our discussants, uh, and um, um, and I think it's a really interesting point that we try to address in uh, in an earlier from an earlier version of the paper. So basically, we see that there are these differential effects that may um, uh, to the um, uh, to the amount of loans that houses get. But then the question is, uh, 
could they are they considered also to hire or like uh, 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 on, on, on house tax? So the uh, uh, side the price of the house and the type of the house was in the part. Uh, so um, we try to test for things at the uh, micro level, so using the loan level data, but we don't want to be transferred. Uh, then what we did is uh, we aggregated the data between the money group uh, and uh, we ran this situation for different income groups. And to find I would say, Mara and I'm going to be cautious about these two routes. Um, that uh, there is some evidence uh, that when there is a company in taxes and financial institutions, uh, the income households can include uh, purchase less expensive forms uh, compared to buying the house. So, this is the thing that we find. Uh, and I think that that goes uh, uh, in uh, this corporate uh, uh, findings from before when I was saying that when there is a kind of thing in, in taxes and financial conditions, but the kind of household could do that they can catch uh, by providing uh, higher level gains. But then the households cannot do that. So what they do is basically they purchase uh in six days of course. Uh, so we find some um, minor things uh, on, on, on this uh, story. So um there have been different concerns uh, with the analysis uh, that uh, we perform uh, and um and address these concerts we do with the surpasses chairs. Um so one such concern could be that um the households uh, that, uh, for example, do that uh, it's not necessarily households even on the value of potential of that, but it could be net wealth of household, you know, education level, and so on. Um, another concern could be that the differential effects are not necessarily given uh, by financial policy, but they could be given by monetary policies because monetary policy and monetary policy have been shown of different effects uh, on, uh, on households of different uh, income. And must say, another concern is that macroprudential uh, that uh, is not necessarily the differential effect not necessarily by this. Two specific macroprudential policies, some of them could be other macroprudential policies that are driving all of these uh, elements. So, uh, we address uh, all of these uh, issues uh, um, by controlling uh, the, 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 the different policies, uh, 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 kind of exercises, and we find that uh, the results continue to improve uh, with the same signs and similar studies that are uh, sending with us. So, uh, yeah, I think I'm so in time. Um, so it's just a little bit of food that here is basically what we do with the paper here. Um, we have found some evidence of the letter of lending based on financial policies affecting house of the people and income potentially. We find that higher income uh, households are uh, thinking more affected uh, when not the financial uh, policies that are targeting uh, are total asset finance, which is opposite uh, to uh, the uh, income households are uh, thinking more affected when um, the market potential uh, policies that are targeting risk weighting assets are uh, tightening. Uh, it also show that um, that should not be which will be very sure and uh, in terms of policy and why this is important to the Ryan and policy information you know that is this question. Well, uh, the result suggests that this is another consideration of policy makers or maker gives us another point of consideration uh, when designing uh, and updating um the national policies. Awesome. Thank you very much. So, yeah, I'll just try to work on this. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, most of your specifications are in the website, and you can just be in the website. Like, you know, the most of you can probably share also, would be very interested to skip the back of the chain itself, the regression, without the interaction. Just we, we have a sense of on, on the of the on the the signal that we should expect in the side of the side that I'm doing right now. But at least in this paper, uh, I would be interested to see uh, what are the effects of the policy itself. I understand that when you have to find that it is a way to reach out to the investigation, but I think it would be interesting to see that. Yeah, I think it would be interesting. 
Thank you very much for the topic and papers. I just want to talk about the interpretation of your results on the downgrading for the range. I can even upload them. Also, we will be slightly said that with the new rules, the same thing in the high income households still manage to provide the high income payments while the low income households just go out of the market. So, you don't need to observe this. This is also consistent with the measures like the NTP series are very popular with the policies of the young people households and so on. So the invitation is to reconsider the interpretation of the public by which I invite to ensure that the human court of wealth or the public may be of the household to be in the under the impact. I struggle with all this myself in the context of the US of the states, right? And so, uh, my, my main focus. Um, so, just it's the ECB data mix that I look forward to reading as well. But are these European countries or is this a thing that it is? So, so, so you're a leader on that side. Assessment of prudential policy at what level do the nations uh, do this themselves? I mean, so it's not that easy to get it across the uh, country effects by the city. I mean, it's kind of like a building. And then do you adjust in terms of higher and lower income households? So, this is within the country. Thing. So, uh, what that level is in each country can, can be different. In terms of, um, of which country, right? And the last piece is that my travels in Europe is that there are others cultural differences. Like I know Netherlands, everybody has a no doubt payment practically. Uh, um, you know, they 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 have this uh, you know this lovely risk loving system uh, where people are on a treadmill from. And I just be curious to still sort of the starting in what it's with some of these uh and getting the large amount of dull deeper and yeah, it's trying to keep the science up. Okay, thank you so much for that for the question. So I'm trying to be very smart. Uh so you are absolutely right. And you talk uh when we're thinking about the movie. Like the uh, last expectation of the uh, the way to to test for what we are after, uh, we consider that that uh, also it would require essentially a uh, change of specification and not being able to control from the animal management effect, right? And then I uh, can check what is uh, the effect on the national policy, but the bit is uh, it's not going to be after the sign uh, or the, the, the question that we are after. But the UPQ is something that we will uh, consider. It's going to answer a different question, right? Like how uh, my national policy in general affects the uh, so that we will probably be what we'll be asking, right? Uh, but it's a good point that it's actually the very good say. Um uh I think on the on the second question, I think we try also uh controlling for reliability and uh and so I mean it's like it's a certain number of variables that can be good, but I think it doesn't matter for the variability that not and so we don't have to really worry with our analysis. Uh on Richard's point, um so uh yeah the although like the uh the regulators uh set up on financial policies in different countries and in Europe, so then there is a validation of those uh different um uh countries according to the policy. Uh and um we are essentially controlling for uh the differences uh across different countries uh and also over time it's kind of different. Uh, time and how it 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 Okay, so this is a bit about uh, monetary policy frameworks for technology. And if you have any paper in this literature, 
And you'll start with something like this, you know, about the economy, that are vulnerable to go up to the big to shift, you know, the financial conditions, because they are unable to borrow with the currency, so they borrow in foreign currency, which means that the global financial condition tightens, the exchange rate depreciates, the value of their liability goes up, well, the value of their collateral is tightened by financial conditions that can generate financial uh, we want to kind of swim against the flow, and we want to argue in this paper that while these might be a key concern for some emerging markets, you are the Argentina or the Turkey of this world, but it doesn't capture all the uh, emerging markets. There are some of uh, most emerging markets for whom this currency is actually story doesn't seem to be the key. Uh, the key, uh, the key, the key channel that makes them so vulnerable to, to, to fluctuations in global currency. And I will just put up these axes uh, on the sides. These uh, essential parts that share of external liabilities about the major global currency uh, that is coming from this IMF database. Um, uh, the blue line is for uh, American economies, the blue line for economies, and the red line is for the past economy. As you can see, why in the 90s, uh, emerging economies were very far away, very distant from advanced economies, very distant from advanced economies, with their currency composition of their external liabilities. After the 2000s, they started to uh, borrow increasingly local currency, and right now, the media. Emerging economies and the currency composition, the currency structure of its external liabilities is in line with that of the uh, other of, of, of advanced economies. Of course, there's a lot of the among the emerging economies. Okay, so if I had more time, I would start with some sidelines facts to, to, to try to back my uh, statement in the most solid way, but I don't. So I would start directly with, 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 the, with the theoretical model. Here we are proposing a model which is not based on currency expenses. In our model, the country will borrow in local currency, so there is no currency expansion. The issue is that the country has a shallow financial system, meaning that the domestic financial system is unable to satisfy the demand for credit that is coming from both the private and the public sector. Luckily, foreign investors can help by absorbing some of this credit demand. But this also opens the door for the vulnerabilities, right? Because as foreign investors decide to uh, to to uh, so the country that this this leaves the country uh, this leaves the domestic financial sector out of the pool for absorbing these assets and then trigger the financial. I would then try to argue that this model is a good model in capture of the dynamics that we see both during. A sudden stop, but also before a sudden stop. And finally, and this is what I would like to spend most of my time with you and the secret documents. Uh, we are going to look at optimal policy. And the key message here okay, we're going to study, uh, we're going to study the monetary policy and we're going to highlight the trade offs uh, that the central bank is facing and how other policies can help in this space. And okay, there is one thing I would like to do. Play home from, from this uh, stock is that we're going to show that in this setting, unlike settings very from currency expansion, there is a strong role for macro prudential monetary policy. That is, in our model, monetary policy ex ante has an incentive to increase the interest rate because this will reduce the demand for credit and some from the private sector. It also, it also attracts capital inflows from abroad. All forces will tend to reduce the leverage of the domestic financial sector and will reduce the probability of subsidies. Okay? Of course, due to this additional macro prudential role of monetary policy, monetary policy is forced to deviate from its macroeconomic stabilization objectives, and that's why uh, complementary policies can help to achieve both uh, significant. Okay, so six, 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 yeah. Okay, the model. So the model is the core of the model is is uh, 
is a, a conventional lineage of the of the government. So in the households, then in the supply level, they say to buy a deposit in the Western Bank, you are capital producers and you are producers of tradable goods. Uh, this guy set price in domestic currency that will be uh, in perfect exchange rate plus to do export, but perfect exchange rate plus to do imports. So uh, the dominant goods are entirely uh, severe. Uh, okay, the key assumption here is on the financial system. So let me talk about the financial system. So the financial system is composed by a bunch of banks. These banks, what do they do? Well, they have some network and they collect deposits from households and they use and they generate this fund to uh to, to borrow. Okay, what about it? So uh, the banks issue loans to capital producers and then they lend to the government by purchasing government loans. Now, all these assets are denominated in local currencies. The loans to the capital producers are longer playing on the uh, on the on the on the return produced by the underlying units of fiscal capital, while the government bonds are long-term real assets which are denominated in units of domestic consumption. So in practice they are in local currency. If you want to think of them as inflation index local currency bonds, that's what they are. Okay. Now we're going to assume that uh, these banks face a moral hazard problem while they are perfect to that. This moral hazard problem simply says that these guys can run away with the fracture of their assets and they realize that the creditors impose this incentive to a constraint, which is just a time value added constraint, which says that the value of the bank has to be always better or equal than the value of the assets that they can see. Okay. But what is the meaning of this constraint? So this constraint captures the idea that I think uh, sorry, that was, uh, before that the domestic financial system is shallow. That is, these banks by themselves are not able to satisfy the demand for credit that is coming from the private sector and the public sector at a prevailing interest rate. Now, luckily, foreign investors can help in this regard. Why? Because foreign investors can absorb. And buy and invest in the, in the, in the bond issue by the, by, the, by the government and therefore absorb part of the demand for credit. Okay? We are not allowed for investors to lend directly to firms, they can only absorb part of the demand for credit that is coming from the banks, from the, the public so, Okay, And by doing so, they reduce the burden on the domestic banks and therefore allows them to. To, to start to, 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 to free up balance sheet capacity to lend to the, to the, to the private sector. Okay. Now, this is great, but it's also the source of the vulnerability. It's, it's, uh, it's foreign capital is good because it helps domestic banks to satisfy the net for credit, domestic net for credit, but it also opens the door for a lot of property. Why is that? Well, because one global financial condition, because it believes it's a domestic economy, exposed to fluctuation in global financial condition. When global financial condition tightens, the foreign investors pull out of these economies and these banks find themselves in trouble. Now, we're going to model uh, fluctuation in global financial condition as, as completely exogenous. We are basically a shock to the foreign interest rate, the interest rate that foreign investors compared uh, when they, when they, when they uh, arbitrage between, between the foreign interest rate and the domestic bonds. And what happens when global financial condition dies? Well, the first time, so how the question is, without the service mismatch kind of, uh, kind of mechanism, how does global financial condition translate into domestic financial condition in our model? Well, there are two channels. The first one is the direct capital flow channel. What happens when global financial condition dies? That is, R star goes up. When R star goes up, B star goes down. That is, foreign investors start dumping their assets, uh, subshelling this, this, the government bonds from their portfolios. This means that domestic banks 
are the only ones that are able to absorb these points, okay? Which means that they have to level up in order to absorb these points. But since they are constrained, they have a maximum on the amount of leverage that they can achieve due to the acceptable probability of strain uh, that I discussed before. It might be the case that in order to do that, the constraint might become binding, therefore, acidifies that to fall, spreads have to rise, and at least the trigger the next financial problem. There is a second channel, which is the price channel. Uh, okay, sorry, the capital flow channel clearly directly, it's, it's, it's uh, I like to look here, directly tightens the leverage constraint because it increases the right hand side of this of this, of this constraint. There is a second channel, which is the price channel. As R star goes up, inflation goes uh, goes up, but expected inflation falls, meaning that the real interest rate goes up. This reduces asset prices, and asset prices keeps the constraint on both sides. On the one hand, lower asset prices generate losses for the banks and reduce their network, therefore tightening the constraint on the left hand side. But it also means the value of the assets that they have to. Hold on their balance sheet, okay? That's for the value of the asset that they can see. It is the constraint on the right hand side. Okay? If the first channel dominates, then the price channel contributes to the tightening of the, of the, of the constraint. All right, uh, that's it. That's how it works. Of course, when the capital output is strong enough, then through this two channel, the, the leverage constraint becomes finding and it triggers a uh, full blown domestic financial crisis. Okay, that's the key mechanism. So let's start with some of the results. Now, in order to solve for the optimal policies we cross for, we will have to take some shortcuts. Uh, and I will explain uh, what kind of shortcuts we take uh, later. But in order to understand whether this is a crude model or not, uh, I, I have another paper with the students from Charles Hopkins, in which we solve this model globally, it was occasional time for second, and we calibrate it to a bunch of inflation target in the case. Now, here we call the local projections of uh, of the variables after a sudden stop, where a sudden stop is defined as usual as, as, a, as a fall in gross capital inflows to standard deviation below the mean. The red line are the local projection estimated of the data from our sample, and the blue line are estimated from the model. From the data as you can see, the model captured well. The fall uh, in, the, in, the, in the real variables that occur uh, during the sudden stop, the fall of GDP growth, consumption growth, and investment growth. It does relatively well also in inflation. And it's not perfect, uh, of course, like uh, like uh, all the other models. It, 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 can, it, it generates the depreciation, the real and nominal depreciation that occurs during a sudden stop, but it's kind of half of what we see in the future. Okay, so for the current calibration, we underestimate the depreciation. We are working on this to see whether uh, and how we can do it. But in general, it's, it seems like it captures the behavior of the variable during the sudden stop. But it's, what is more interesting, I think, is what happens prior to a sudden stop. Here I'm plotting the IRFs uh, with respect to a uh, uh, well, who's in, in global financial condition? So, what happens when global financial conditions become looser? That is, R star goes down. Uh, well, as you can see, there is a boom in the domestic economy. GDP, uh, the GDP goes up, there is a boom in asset prices, and capital flows into the into the energy economy. Now, here is the interesting picture. Here I'm plot the bars are the probability of uh, a sudden stock. As you can see in the short term, the probability of a sudden stop compared to the ergodic uh, mean of the growth. Uh, as you can see, in the short term, the probability of a sudden stop goes down. Why is that? Well, there is a boom in asset price that is recapitalized to the banks. There are huge, there is a bonanza of capital inflow that are absorbing these government bonds. So, of course, the leverage of the banks is falling, they are farther away from the constraint, and therefore the probability of the constraint. However, after a few years, we turn positive. Now, it's more likely that the constraint uh, becomes fine. Why is that? Well, after a few years, the capital inflows, after two years, the capital inflows are, are done. You know, 
the, 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 the but all the domestic credit that has been generated during the boom phase of the, of the cycle is still on the balance sheets of the bank. So they find themselves over stretch, they are leveraged above their got the, 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 their leverage of the economy, and therefore they are closer to the leverage of Spain. So smaller shock, smaller shock, <laughs> smaller shock will drive you to the constraint. So this means that I mean, this model, this model can generate the boom bust cycles that we observe in the day. A capital inflow shock generates a boom in the short run, but it's all the seeds for a bust in the medium run. In fact, in simulate the model, you see that the uh, that the uh, the sudden stop occurs after periods of, of, of a large increase in capital inflows. Okay, it will not occur when capital inflows are low. Okay. Now, I promise I'm talking about the uh, Okay, so we need to take shortcuts. How do we do it? I mean, we're working on the optimal policy goals in the global model, uh, but for, 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 for the moment, that's what we have. Um, how do we do it? Uh, we need to simplify it. So, what we do is we log linearize the model, we shrink it into three periods, and we transform the occasional binding constraint into a matter of switch, which we we have three periods. Time one is the flexible price set. It's the long run of this model. Time one is where things go wrong. We grow it to grow. Uh, there is a large high large tightening in the global financial condition makes the level, uh, the bank's leverage constraint uh, fine. And then we have time zero, which is the exact period because we also want to be very exciting points. Okay, the objective. Of the central bank is to minimize the stock's function. The central bank wants to stabilize out the inflation. We assume no commitment and we look at this, uh, at this, uh, at all these tools. I'm going to talk about them. Um, the beauty of this thing is that despite the model is still non linear due to the macro switch part, we still can be solving the close form and derive the optimal policies uh, uh, rules because. Okay, what happened in the southern stock is not very interesting. We all know there is a trade off because output and inflation moves in opposite direction, but monetary policy can only, control, can only move them in the same direction. So you, want, you would like to use additional, uh, additional tools in the, I would say, uh, in the direction that you would expect. What I really would like to show is the optimal monetary policy rule that I'm seeing. As you can see, the optimal monetary policy rule at time zero has the two conventional objectives output stabilization, output is above the same state we want to tighten, inflation. If inflation is above the same state we want to tighten, it's obvious these, these variables are indirect in the objective function of the central bank. But as you can see, there are other objectives in the optimal policy. What are these other objectives? First of all, there is the domestic demand for credit that is coming from the private sector. Loans, finance, capital, and the public sector, government policy. Okay. As you can see, this is telling you that that when the domestic demand for the, the domestic demand for credit is high, the central bank would like to tighten. Why is that? Because when the domestic demand for credit is high, the banks are uh, leveraged. They enter into time one with a, with a higher leverage. They are closer to the constraint, and if uh, a tighten the shock, the tight as global financial condition we analyze it, the, 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 the domestic financial products will be weaker. There is an additional one, and it's capital inputs. As you can see, it is telling you that when now when capital inputs are low, are below their steady state, now the central bank would like to increase the interest rate. Why is that? Well, because by increasing the interest rate, you attract more capital inflows. Capital input, that foreign capital uh, um, uh, absorb some of the demand for credit, allow the banks to leverage it, and this reduces the probability that uh, we reduce the severity of a sudden stop if it were not idealized. Now, let me stress that these objectives arise endogenously in the, they are not in the objective function of the central bank, but they arise endogenously. Why is that? Because the central bank cares about. Out of the inflation stabilization, not only today, but also tomorrow. So today it will try to affect the state variables of this model, which are capital inflows and credit demand, to me to, to try to help the, 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 the central banks of tomorrow to mitigate 
to, to, to stabilize out the benefit. Okay. Of course, as I said before, the fact that you have this additional objective means that you might have to deviate, the second angle you might have to deviate from its macroeconomic stabilization objectives. Okay. This rule tells you that the second angle step into the spray as an average between all of these objectives, which means that it will, uh, in order to minimize the, 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 the severity of the crisis tomorrow, you might allow output inflation to deviate from their targets today. This means that you could use uh, additional tools that will allow you to achieve macroeconomic and financial stabilization at the same time. Uh, which tools? Well, let's start by looking at micro potential tools. Micro potential tools, in this model, is just a tax on the return of capital. So, if you increase the tax, what happens? Well, do we discourage investment and therefore you reduce the demand for credits that is coming from the private sector? It's in turn lower the leverage. However, there is a cost of doing that as you, as you, as you increase uh, the, uh, the micro potential tax. You are also reducing capital inflows, which has the opposite effect, it tends to high to increase leverage. So the net effect, whether you would like to increase macrodimensional tax or reduce macrodimensional tax, depends on the balance of these two channels. Now we can show that with the calibrated global model, the first time it of that sort of optimal ex ante macrodimensional tax. Uh, is this possible? Right? The central bank has to tax capital uh, in order to, uh, to reduce the capital of credit. Okay. Uh, okay. The capital inflow tax similarly has two opposite effects. If you increase the tax on capital inflows, you are increasing the leverage, right? You are discouraging capital inflows and these. As as a as a increase the leverage to the domestic bank. Remember, capital inflows, capital flow that good for this economy. So you don't want to do that. But on the other hand, if you increase the capital inflow tax, you are also reducing the domestic demand for credit because you are increasing the real interest rate that this economy is facing, and therefore uh, you are reducing investment in the demand for loans. Of course, the net effect depends on the balance of the suit. We can show that in the calibrated model, the second channel economies and the optimal example capital inflow tax would be similar possible. Okay. If you increase capital inflow tax, then you reduce the risk of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the surface. Uh, we can also show that uh, the macro potential, the macro potential tax is more effective than capital flow management tools, the capital inflow tax. Uh, and that's how it is. That's it. I'm not going to repeat the questions. Think about it's great that's a better than the which is that it's much tighter for the impacts that they're all domestic companies. In practice, I don't think there are any countries that risk like domestic products So if you're taking seriously the capital environment that you're not buying. No, I mean, you know that this is a you can develop it literally as a capital environment, or you can develop this as a useful way of generating linear uh, without going through the pain of 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 uh of uh this kind of we would have to do it the same, but this this is a shortcut to generate because it's so it's all and it's that's that's the why it's so so I guess my question is if there have people looked at whether this is strong, whether when there's more data assignment for the domestic company, how do we get it? In fact, how do you think about it? when the trade-offs are taken? Say it again. In case this is the case that your story is a bigger problem when there's more government data assignment that the domestic banks are not Yeah, so. Fair question, we haven't looked into that. Uh, um, but yeah, there is absolutely a fair question. There is nothing particular about the government that this was the corporate that, right? In the model, the mechanism of the model would work the same. 
The only thing that this model is saying is that there is an asset that foreign investors can hold and that can help the domestic, and then this generates the fact that the foreign capital is, is, is helpful for the domestic economy. So when it goes out, you know, it goes up. Uh, so, uh, so it's a fair question, just saying that like, maybe it's not going for that, maybe it's not going for but on the other hand, you know, the top of that is mostly done in foreign purposes. So, yeah, it will be a little bit first. Yeah, two questions. I have a one theoretical. The critical question is in the recent uh, episodes, central banks have substituted for foreign investors, the JSA partners for the data collection. It, should that be a criminal model? So the constraint is, is oh, sorry. It is doing the southern star indeed. The central bank has you're referring to me by making yeah. yeah, it is. It's of course optimal to do QE when the southern is doing the southern stock. You would like to do it exactly for that reason. You want to have your you want to yeah, substitute for the foreign investor. You don't want to leave your domestic financial system on the hood to absorb all that goals. You want to do it yourself. Now you can do it. The lots of it, but you can also do it right by, by buying the uh, initial tech of bank reserves, but you can also do it, do it with, with, with foreign restraints. What's the constraints for a central bank to do that? Oh, um, there is no constraint. You need to have you need to, to have uh exogenous forces. Otherwise, of course, it's optimal for the central bank to do it as much as possible and feel the constraints on yeah. But you need to have it. Yeah. You're giving the central bank, yeah, it's an unfair game. It's a central bank that can do whatever the domestic financial system does, but it's also for the central bank. So, yeah. What are your questions? I just wanted to put it in a political setting. I don't think we will reach one of our providing of smaller economic federalization. And if I maximize this, I think it will be. Uh, yeah, there is the technical costs for this study, right? So, uh, as I just said, like, uh, these costs will have to be exogenous. Without these exogenous costs, uh, 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 you have five, you know, four objectives, so maybe at most four of these, uh, of these, uh, of these, um, of these forces would be enough for you to achieve this, uh, but without any cost, we cannot tell what is the best combination. So, uh, in, in this DIS model, we can so we track the whole for that So, thanks to one for the ERO and the the obstacle rather that's between the UN and the American. Um, so I am very happy that uh, you can do the thing, you can do the programming, but you can give. I always thought that Zebra was kind of a mysterious secret organization, but it also keeps rejecting my paper because you know, strange things are happening. But it turns out that actually, you know, so the old friends and colleagues are very happy to be here. So this project is called Critical Game Micro Configurations. It's going to work with the new burnout. And the motivation here is that, as I said, metal Google people that are familiar with financial stability topics, after the expansions, they've been credited, especially when credit moves to the private sector, are often about always small finance to the economic dollars. But that's what we get all of us here, probably a pretty well familiar uh, with. But there are still, I think, well, really important questions that we don't really understand the constant relationship between credit rules on one hand and my personal on the So the kind of key question I think that's so much literature is why is it that it's almost credit expansion and value? But other credit expansions are I think related to growth stores or even productivity purposes. And how if that's the case, how can we develop parties going from that rules to use some language from a thing of that work and and perhaps more on a fundamental level, does it matter who gets all this foreign money if you're accredited? It seems like something that should intuitively matter, but it's something that uh, I think they're about to do. And so, what we try to do with this paper is argue that the sectoral allocation, so which sectors in the economy receive credit, 
it's important to understand the difference between credit rules and macroeconomic competition. Okay, so why should we hear about the sectoral allocation of credit? Our main motivation here really comes from the last literature in the natural macro. The things about the world is essentially considering about different sections. So, you know, the idea is here think about a world where you have a tradable sector, so they come out of manufacturing work, for example. If a non tradable sector, so they come structure, local restaurants, local retailers, and so on, and your household. And so, with that set up, if the insights from the literature are really bad, then to the non trade sector, so firms here, non trade sector, also households, should be more sensitive to changes in the world of interest for me. But think of it as the stock to credit system. And that is what should be more likely to increase financial freedom. We have, for example, the effectivity of Aristotle, finance, finances, and economics. If you think about the tradable sector in these models, Credit growth there should really be associated with an acceleration of productivity. If the trade sector is to be assuming those models, this is the nature of growth in the economy, for example, in this paper by the nature of that. And so, you know, we have this theoretical predictions, but the perhaps the most prominent theories on the credit cycle, so we think about how emphasize that the network of kind of institutions, you know, the those that think about the behavioral factors and current cycles, they do not really feature this kind of same call in the native. So whether this actually matters in data is I think something that is really quite unique. And so what is it that we do in this paper? Um, we test, we try to test for a role of the sectoral allocation of credit using a new data set. So really the backbone of this year is many, many years of painstaking data, and by more years than I'm going to do in my face. But so what we get from this, we basically get this data set that measures domestic lending and in contrast to existing work, domestic lending by a set. And so we, we have co we combine here more than 600 individual sources that we went country by country, lots of stuff we need to digitize, so that's all the we do in the same time. And we the main thing that matters here is trying to harmonize the sectoral classification across countries, right? So if you go to one country and you know, they might have to want something about agriculture, it's not necessarily the same that another country might be the agriculture. So it's a little bit like building national accounts on the ground, right? You really have to people come to you and come here and listen all the institution details, the detail of all this data on the board and all that changes over time. And so, and so just to kind of figure out the is of all this here compares to all that existing sources on the private credit. The only existing sources that we were aware of that drive the T home polls told on standing private sector credit in the economy is one set work by George Fuller and Taylor. There's the IMS and for the global debt database, and there's one work by Matthias the Paulus and the US. And so basically what these data sets give us is some differentiation between the then into farms and then into households. Here in George Fuller and Taylor, they also introduce so C for the order of A. But what is really different about us here is that we can differentiate for an average of 16 sectors uh, the average of the households versus firms. And we also have just a much broader coverage in terms of countries than here. So in total of this data set, we get you was 120 countries inside the mid 1990. And so what we do with this data set uh, what we find, the first thing we document are what we think are pretty striking differences in the outcomes or uh, macroeconomic outcomes all in different types of countries. And so in particular, consistent with, with, uh, with this longitudinal literature, credit to the non trade sector also also tends to be followed by a slowdown in economic growth, the recession, while lending to the tradable sector, anything for the stable or even higher GDP growth going forward. And when we dig a little bit into potential mechanisms, we can find two main channels for this. So the first one that I'm going to give you a today is financial profitability channel. Here, uh, we see that as we see more credits flowing, especially for the non tradable sector, we see an increase in risk of the financial crisis. The banking crisis are highly correlated with the soft stocks that the bubble that talks about. We also see a higher probability of a reversal in house prices. 
The second challenge, what I won't show you this today in terms of pilot, we also show that more credit over to the non tradable sector is associated with a really extreme rate of appreciation and lower productivity. And so then in the models of the this this is simply because of some mechanical result of the trading sector is more productive than the non tradable sector. So if you give more money to the non tradable sector, you would have lower productivity. You can think of this as a suggestion of a misallocation of resources. So what's kind of the, the technique here? What we're trying to say is whether credit moves into any value or not really seems to depend to a significant degree to what that trend is used for. And so in particular, what you really have to look at in the data set of the argument is you have to look at different types of non credit expansions. And if you look at households versus firms, that's not going to be the informative that's directly between where it operates in the credit. Okay. Let me start here with some data background. So, as I mentioned, you know, the, this is kind of a, a multi year effort where we try to scroll through a lot of primary and secondary sources to put together this data set. So, as I mentioned, we have more than 600 individual sources of the plant, statistical year works, all publications by central banks, so the only by specific libraries. For example, in Austria, you have to uh, actually uh, apply for access to a specialized library that you apply to Vienna, that you can only use their books to this library, right? That's the only way to get access to this category. So, in many cases, you're also lucky that if you just annoy central banks, not that often, they actually end up sending you some kind of data that they have lying around somewhere that's not actually publicly available. So, you know, sometimes it can just be very annoying that also gets on. But really, the key thing is that. As we were going through these different types of data, we had help from more than 150 uh, employees of these different, different national agencies, right? So the, the, the list of acknowledgements in the papers was you know, super long because basically every country that we contacted, they helped us in some way and trying to figure out the details of what it's doing. Yeah, so what, what, we, what we gave from you know, all this you know, all this time spent, we had the status to help us close to 120 countries with some couple more that are that are going to add. Currently, we covered 1940 to 2014, where we updated the data for almost all of these, so there will be a new release in a couple of months. And um, uh, in fact, we're going to release and make publicly available the uh, first version of this data next week. So at the end, we are surprised to all of you are around in the session from the high end data sources. So I'm going to be presenting this overall project um, there. And then you must have a total follow up with this data update that we are going to release data with higher frequency in any case for monthly or quarterly frequency and keep it the, the, the on and ongoing basis. Okay, so you know, just one more picture here, right? So, I'll also be thinking about this data, right? The one that gets right. This is where this comes from. Lots of variable books, you know, you try to take pictures, and then what you see is that it's really quite astonishing. The degree of detail that you can see in some of these whole publications. For example, you know, the left side, this is the Canada Bureau from the 1950s. And you know, right now, if you go to the world like that, you can see all the total credit in Canada was some number, right? But what you see here is okay, this is how much lending there was to the open beverage and tobacco manufacturers. This is how much uh, of the credit there was to the higher and steel companies, right? So, the, the, this was very, very detailed data that we were able to put together on the right hand side. You see, uh, I have to talk, yeah, of course, on the Austrian Okay. One more thing that's important here is that, of course, we were proposing that this is the, the most comprehensive way to measure credit markets across countries, but, but you know, why should you leave us, right? We just did some of the songs to our archives. So, one indication of our data is actually uh, quite comparable with the existing sources when we look at total credit, is this picture. So, what I'm just going to show you here is what if you go to the website of the IMF and you download the escape series on total credit to the private sector? Then you just overlay that from the same countries for the power data. That's, we see it's the same data. Right? So, basically, how you can think of this data is that what we have now is not just this line, but actually, we see the entire composition of the credit market in uh, around 120 countries. Uh, and in fact, uh, we're going to have a website where we can explore this data and details on the six months of the step of grass. You can look at the data and download it for anything more than your own work. Okay, so just one more thing to mention about the data. We need to um, define a couple of important variables for our analysis. So, in particular, we need to define what do you mean by credit growth. 
And so here, uh, what we're trying to do is to the distraction between the tradable and non tradable sectors. So just for the purpose of the statement, we will say that it will be agriculture mining manufacturing, the standard definition in international micro, and then the non tradable sector. Interface with class five those is slightly different because we could say construction and real estate, retail, and wholesale trade, accumulation, food transport, and communication. That's not trade. Right? So, you can think of this as a factory, but also kind of global services, right? So, it's predominantly stuff that it doesn't be a single problem. Okay, so, you know, again, just to remind you, the purpose of this is to have an empirical counterpart to be serious in the national market. Where the not tradable sector, we can see an idea, which are kind of less common, and the summary, and the planet, or that, et cetera, is that non tradable sector can be more sensitive to changes in the current supply. But the tra tradable sector in general can be in the bottom of these models, is extremely more productive. That's kind of what, what I wanted to get from. Okay. First question What happens? During uh, the credit, during credit, for so other words, we had just all that credit flow during credit. Flows. Here's a very simple picture. What we do is first identify credit release is we kind of set up the methodology. So we deep trend changes in total credit between the economy and the class of both that source. And then here we simply plot changes in lending to households, not tradable sector, and the tradable sector around the onset of the credit. So what you can see this picture here is that relative to five years before the moon starts, during this movie period, credit is predominantly to low school households. But when you look on the front side, it's really all going to the non trade system. So we think this is important as side as fact because it tells us that there's really a credit reallocation happening on average during these three years. Now, this is also consistent with uh, the kind of prediction that the sectors might simply differ in finance and constraints. So, if you think about the credit rules of time, of having lax credit, easy credit, and what this is, it's that a non tradable sector reacts more to this kind of change of time. Okay, we also collect some progression evidence. This is a very simple type of progression in the by the country, sector, and the year. What we're interested in is is it true that credit? Goes more to a particular sector based on particular characteristics. And so, what we find is that during credit flows, credit disproportionately goes to the non trade of the sector. Another way to think about this is that it's an industry where a lot of small crowds, these are industries that rely quite a lot on real estate as a product, just a side as a Okay, so this is what happens during credit flows, this is where the credit is long. But the next question is why should we care about this right? What happens to the fire economy on cost depending on the degree of the credit flows? See, the first way to think about this is that we simply do the exact same exercise when we identify credit because again, the time from here is a credit boom, this is the time after this is the time before. But now what I'm showing you is the change in real GDP per capita for all these credit booms. Depending on where the trade is actually from. And so the blue line from top is what we call tradable sector bias schemes. So there are 35 of those that are on a quarter of the credit groups that we identify with the little less. And what you can see is that this is the credit group size and maybe it slows down a little bit for top. But what happens in the 87 cases, the last majority of cases where near the credit group, credit disproportionately goes to the non trade sector. We see a big drop in GDP per capita in this case. So, this is kind of a first indication that we are the current slow during the group, but also matter for our micro models. And we then ask for generally additional on you see a particular type of credit expansion, what happens on average per GDP going forward? And the way we do this is by estimating people's responses. Using local projections. So essentially, these are regressions here of changes in real GDP on a full set of country fixed effects. And then we have exchanged the tradable sector, non tradable sector, and households fall on the scale of the GDP. And if you look at this kind of a particular term horizon, we can look at this like five years out and we adjust that the standard there of natural new genes. Okay, so this is the key pattern here and the key takeaway from our data. So what you can see here are Nichols responses of region to the innovation in non-tradable sector credits here on the left side, 
and the three little separate brackets come around once a week. What you can see is essentially these have different sizes. Right? So after you see an expansion in the non-traded separate bracket, you systematically see a small amount of growth of the five six years. On the tradable state that you see one credit go over there, if anything you see that higher GDP go And so we think that this is very important because it one tells us something about um that it has to be rolls project and how that might happen. But you know, also you have samples where I said that the existing evidence, right? These are the bad credit use, these are perhaps the good credit which is also by the so stick to with this acceleration is in the middle. The picture looks very same as the one with the add household credit to the base. And this guy's going to show me one of the literature that also fit tends to forecast that now turn in GDP. If we add that, we have that here, we can all trade a little trade will say the credit looks very similar. And it also looks very similar that we replace the dependent beer with the unemployment. So if you get an even stocker result, you can see more changes in unemployment going to follow. It's we call it coming from this non credit and sector credit, it's not being called a kind credit, it's not being used. Don't see my thumb. So, the paper with cost of additional results for us, so it's that one that I'm working with. But I just want to quickly talk about the other just to make it. So, why is it that non credit and sector credit should be linked to these possessions, but not trade and sector credit? It's the two kind of uh, the pieces of evidence that we provide in the paper is number one. Something on financial fragility, which I will show you now. And then there, we also have quite a few results on productivity benefits, just make sure that I'm always giving you all of those. So the key finding that we have is that the credit expansion in one credit sector is linked to groups of us in the sense that you see a higher probability of financial currency. And we also see that linked to the trade of sector is linked to higher currency. Okay, so the first six year on financial fragility. We already know from the existing literature that financial um, crises have uh, really uh, large effects on macroeconomic outcomes, especially in this large division. And so, what we're trying to present here is essentially two key new results to the literature. Which is number one, this uh, financial crisis then be systematically preceded by non trading sector and also the credit institution. And the second result that I think is very important is that. During those tiny prices, so just after they hit, if you look at where the falls actually come from during those prices, like what's kind of eroding the bank's capital position, we see that the majority of that comes from lending to the large banks. We think that's quite important because uh, that tells us a little bit how, uh, how wiser these different types of credit structures we make to French link to its prices. Okay, I'll show you here the first result. Which is simply a replication of the existing literature. It is an event study times zero. It's the start of a systemic banking crisis. We use dates to compare the Rajon and the label Valencia. When we see the right hand side, we are the years after the financial crisis hit, and you see how the years before. So we're particularly interested in this kind of boom period, what happens before the crisis. This is simply a replication of the existing literature with much more data, which is that. Here on the, on, the, on, the, on the on this text, I'm showing you changes in the credit to GDP. For example, here, uh, the number that is 0.2, that would mean there's a, a change in credit to GDP going from, you know, say, 60% of GDP to 80% of GDP. So, so what you can see is here, this is there's a credit expansion moving into a financial crisis. We look at the loss of the economy, so it's what we can do. But what we can do about two years, we can decompose that by saying, so the first thing I need to do is look at household and fund for the second. And essentially the finding is to sign okay, household that seems to expand with the burden and fund for the fund. But what we're really interested in is this fund for it, because that what we see here is that we this the entire expansion of fund for the financial privacy. So again, driven by the non traders. This was not much action in the trading sector in the product. What is really important is that once the price hits, it's also true that much of the contraction so the credit crunch of the other active prices is also not by the stock trading of GDC. Well, this is not only limited to kind of a construction and real estate, for example, if I think of Spain in the 2000s, Ireland in the 2000s, right? So kind of uh, typical cases of big, big construction. If you see the data, 
then you can construct a new city class, matrix programs. But it's not the same. We also see a very similar pattern if we look at the retail policy that we have this red line. It looks very similar to the construction of units. So it's not just the housing sector per se that seems to matter for these tablets. If you look at the trading sector, you look at manufacturing, mining, agriculture, this will not most actually in the credit market here and all these fronts. Also, with a similar exercise, we are now we try to predict prices using different kinds of credit flow. And here, what we find is just to give you kind of a sense that a one standard deviation higher growth in non trade set of credit, then it takes your average probability of an average crisis, which might be three percent or something like that, to something like 10 years. So, you know, there really seems to be a significant extent of predictability in that sense of not prices if you just look at this aggregate depression. The last piece that I want to show, show you is. That something on defaults during high rate crisis. Because to the best of our knowledge, that I would be very happy to work with common sense, is there's actually not much evidence on who is it that actually defaults during these high rate crisis. It seems like a kind of important question to understand. And so, um, what we are doing is we collect some new data on not performing in the by sector for 10 crisis where we're going to do that. And I'll show you some suggested evidence that it's really not the really sector that matters for understanding it to many crisis. So here's the first picture. This just shows you what's the default rate of these different segments, not very really available uh, for the segment of households in crisis. So think about this bad laws, survival of all those measure on default rate. You can see that the default rate of the non trading sector is much higher than the trading sector, much higher than what households. And here you see from the metric picture, which is you take high growth in credit for the non trading sector, combined with high default rates. And what you see is that the majority of battles during the banking crisis is put back on the non trading sector. So let me just want to iterate here to say that I hope I convince you that sector allocation of the credit. Maybe the just question you asked, so actually in the bank default literature, there is sufficient evidence to show this in the uh, construction development account. So I want to that the bank is more likely to do the We can talk about that later on. Another question I'd like to go back to that. Would you say that it's a difference between man and supply? So when banks supply a lot of credit to the economy, you're more likely to see disasters where when the like firms are technologically advancing and demand credit, that this is a good thing for the economy in the future. Yeah, so there's a very good paper by Ellen Gray. She does not a sector setup, but she has a bit of a of that report of things because they work on new technology studies as well. Um, and so there, that's basically the argument. The argument is that the credit supply moves bad, credit demand moves good, right? And so the intuition, I think, is, is makes sense, right? Like if there's actual demand for something, and financing is really not more problem. Right? I think that's kind of consistent with what we're finding here. Isn't that a different piece of the question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, all the credit to one credit is a set collateralized by out. Um, and some of these are really set to be Yes, so that is something not. Yeah, so of course, like she had defined the supply demand here is kind of tricky. The best thing, the best that we have is what I should put in the rest of the all that. During booms, industries that are higher reliance on real estate as collateral, they tend to receive more credit than credit. So I think that is kind of the, the best evidence and sources that we have that leads to like increased power of relaxing in the finance industry. But it was very hard to test these kind of data. Yes, some, some previous empirical papers show that you know, there is a sort of short term versus long term trade offs. Here, actually, when you look at the intersections, sectors, there's no longer such a kind of trade off. Yeah, so I think you talk about the layouts of the beam, and I think it is like 2006. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, so, the, uh, so it's, it's a good question. So, I think mean, one way of interpreting these files is of sense, right? I, mean, I think the market wants to look at a lot of papers is that uh, this whole idea that you know, maybe finance you really overload in the long run or whatever, right? You know, it might cause probably short 
run what's all that still up there. All of you did not put up the of video My expression said it's really much more of a credit as well. It seems to be much more important than that, you know, all the rise with that. But even if we want to go with you today, right? We're really have to take this out, right? So some systems are already and the, this is already the point. So I can thank you. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Thank you. I, I love the chart where you get your education. Not everybody does that. Thank you. Thank you. You're talking about China. So, quick question. One is household credit, mortgage credit, is it housing? And then the other thing that I see is there's often a correlation between credit expansion to households for that and also for construction for in terms of new. It's going to be interesting. I can't believe really it, but to, to see if there is some uh, interaction. Yeah, so uh, the, the, the short explanation is you know, that's the cost of multiple credits, largely mortgage credits. You know, you're already really not being like, surprised about that. It's yeah. largely consumer credit. So there's much less mortgage credit in, in emerging markets. And there's definitely a soft correlation between infrastructure security and also credit, especially if it's a last not a little bit. I think it's, I think what we don't really understand that is that some of this just driven by this fact of the is that you're kind of referring to, right? The credit goes also the matter. Right? Also, also, wants to buy a house, you build a house, right? You're very close to that. Then you should get higher protection, right? But I think that's something that you know, that at least we sort of want to find So I just want to um, go off on the question. Um, I would like to add a little machine on um, uh, houses, uh, house homes, because I think to explain to some extent, like, uh, I mean, the kind of prices are the more of the only you can get, and then put a condition with like uh, large boxes. Yeah, I, I just saw the, the heterodox column is called the Bizilla has published the paper 2014 that makes exactly this argument that house, the like the improvement of construction and low productivity gains and should be the right because should be the biggest points about where the credit grows actually so much more. Do you notice the future? Do you draw on it or it doesn't matter because of your best data? You think about the rooms where the credit is going to the contracts to the trades. So, if the kind of literature on policy advice, and this I think overlaps with a lot of your data, you know, think that the narrative, for example, for Korea is that there was a very active policy decision which had these national champions, and you know, there was a lot of financial repression, and the credit was actively targeted. Or the credible well, sector, there was a lot of other stuff that they were doing. So, can you, have you thought about how much your good and bonus overlap with those kinds of policies? I really like that because I'm actually working with you that was in the Now, we have a new project that we collected data on exactly these times of credit policies. We identified something like 60 of them, even as the meeting that the data sets it with the previous work, you will see on the very difficult to identify. And essentially, what we find is that you know that these credit policies indeed entitled credit to the tradable sector. So Korea is very good example. Uh, we actually naturalized the banking system at the time. I think this was in the early 60s. And what you see afterwards is actually all the credit is flowing to a high tech company. So this, I think, we believe this attack was going on. It's also related to the discussion about the particulars in the economy. Uh, right? So, of course, it's not that it's new, right? So, already more than 100 years ago, right? In Austria, this is a site that we already talked about this, right? And um, the stream is a uh, very big time, and the banks started to be credit giving. And I know that we have some statements as well. The issue of, in some sense, in some sense, of the is that there are very few correlations and there are very few students, right? right? And so, I also acknowledge that for here, just like, well, think this like 100 years ago, that's my theory. You know, it's also something that we're trying to like this. Uh, you know, here are some two things. So, first, you should control here on those prices. This really doesn't make any difference, which is surprising a bit because you know, this is a clear fact, right? We house prices are collateralized uh, or 
what you can find, which we might see, like many of the results, we have to take up the final paper, but what we find is that more than even the non tradable sector actually predates kind of uh, the house you move and bus. Why don't you have more lending to the trade of the secular just to make higher house prices? So, our interpretation is that this decision because we don't pay them once. We just get higher to the people who are for the bills, but we have stable house prices, we don't have to do this in the cost of money. And that's what we do. 